Over the last 25 years, evolutionary approaches to the study of human health and nutrition have received ever greater attention among scholars in a number of different fields. Increasingly, we are coming to realize that many of the key features that distinguish humans from our other primates have important implications for our distinctive nutritional needs. In addition, we are also coming to realize that an evolutionary perspective is useful for understanding both the origins and potential solutions for the growing problems of obesity and associated metabolic disorders. A hallmark of human evolution has been our ability to increase the efficiency with which we extract food from our environments. Humans show remarkable diversity in their dietary regimes, and in reality, what makes us human is our ability to find or make a meal in virtually any environment. Throughout most of the past, human lifestyles were characterized by high levels of physical energy expenditure and frequent periods of marginal or negative energy balance. These conditions selected for improvements in the energetic efficiency of human foraging strategies. Today, we are in many respects victims of our own evolutionary success. Human populations of the industrialized world live in what have been characterized as obesogenic environments. With low levels of energy expenditure and abundant food supplies contributing to strongly positive energy balances and growing rates of obesity. In my research, I've looked at the energetic and nutritional implications of key transitions in human evolution, drawing on information from the human fossil record, from living primate species, and from my own primary field research among modern subsistence day populations. When we look at the evolutionary history of the human lineage, we find that many of the key distinguishing features in human nutritional ecology arise with the emergence of Homo erectus at about 1.8 million years ago in Africa. This phase of human evolution was associated with major changes in brain size, body size, diet composition, and foraging behavior that have had a profound influence on shaping our nutritional requirements through evolutionary time. Indeed, the changes that occurred with Homo erectus established two of the prime drivers in human nutritional and energy needs that have persisted through time. First is the need for a high quality, that is an energy and nutrient rich diet to fuel the high energy costs of our large brains. And in turn, to acquire those nutritionally dense diets, the development of foraging strategies that required movement over wide areas, promoting large activity budgets. Today, I'd like to trace the evolutionary origins of these distinctive human nutritional and energy needs, and then consider their implications for our modern world. <laughs> to establish the context for interpreting the human evolutionary fossil evidence, I'd like to start by looking at the energetic and nutritional correlates of variation in brain and body size among living primates, including humans. We'll then turn to a brief examination of the human fossil record to consider when and under what conditions in our evolutionary past, changes in brain size, body size, diet, and foraging behavior likely took place. Finally, we'll explore the implications of our distinctive metabolic needs for both understanding and confronting the growing problems of obesity and associated chronic diseases in the US and throughout the world. From a nutritional perspective, what is extraordinary about our large human brains is their high metabolic costs. Brain tissue has very high energy demands per unit weight, and as shown here, the brain requires fully 12 kilocalories per kilogram per minute and accounts for a full 400 calories a day in the human adult at rest. Yet despite the fact that humans have much larger brains per body weight than other primates or terrestrial mammals, the total resting energy demands of the human body are no greater than they are for any animal of our size. The implication of this paradox is that humans spend a much larger share of their resting energy budget to feed their brains. As shown here, brain metabolism accounts for fully 20 to 25 percent of resting metabolic rate in the adult human, as compared to about 8 to 10 percent in other primates and only 3 to 5 percent in non-primate mammals. This large allocation of our energy budget to brain metabolism raises the question of how humans are nutritionally able to accommodate the metabolic demands of our brains. It appears that humans consume diets that are much more dense in energy and nutrients than other primates of our size. Indeed, the staple food items of all human societies are much more nutritionally dense than those of other large primates. The higher quality diet that we consume 
means that we need to eat less volume of food to meet our daily energy and nutrient needs. The link between brain size and dietary quality is shown here. This is a slide showing relative brain size plotted against relative dietary quality for the 33 primate species, including humans, for which we have metabolic, brain size, and dietary data. Across all primates, larger brains require higher quality diets, and humans fall at the positive extreme for both of these parameters. In addition, the size and morphology of our gastrointestinal tract also reflect adaptation to a high quality diet. This slide shows the relative proportions of the small and large intestines in humans and the great apes. All of the large-bodied apes have expanded large intestines, or colons, as an adaptation to a fibrous, low-quality diet. Humans, on the other hand, have small total gut volumes for our size and relatively enlarged small intestines and reduced colons. The enlarged colons in apes and other large primates permit fermentation of low-quality plant fibers. In contrast, the GI morphology of humans, that is a small colon and a relatively enlarged small intestine, is similar to that of a carnivore and reflects an adaptation to an easily digested nutrient-rich diet. Another important difference between traditional human societies and other primate species is our territorial needs. Compared to other primates, humans have much larger day and home range sizes. As we see here, day range, that is the typical distance traversed by an animal over the course of the day, averages over 13 kilometers a day in human hunter-gatherers as compared to less than two kilometers a day in chimps and gorillas. Similarly, home range size, that is the total area exploited by an animal group, is much greater in humans than in other primates. Here we see home range size plotted against body mass for 47 non-human primate species and six tropical human hunting and gathering societies shown as the stars. Home range size is strongly associated with body mass. However, humans have substantially larger home range sizes than predicted for a primate of our size. Thus, from a comparative perspective, we find that the key distinguishing features of human nutritional biology are a high quality, nutritionally dense diet to support our large brains and a foraging strategy that necessitated large ranges and high activity budgets. The first evidence of these trends in human evolution is seen with the emergence of the genus Homo and continue to shape our nutritional requirements through today. When we look at the human fossil record, the emergence of Homo erectus in Africa at 1.8 million is widely viewed as a major adaptive shift. What is remarkable about this period of human evolution is that we find major changes in both brain size and body size, the evolution of human-like body proportions, archaeological and skeletal evidence for dietary change, and for the first time in human evolution, the rapid expansion of hominids out of Africa to other parts of the old world. The archaeological and fossil evidence suggests that with Homo erectus, we have the development, perhaps, of the first rudimentary hunting and gathering economy, with major dietary change being incorporated into this package. These changes in foraging and dietary behavior also helped to provide the energetic fuel that was necessary to support rap rapid evolution of brain and body size. This adaptive package that we see with Erectus highlights many of the key changes that we see as being distinctly human in terms of our nutritional requirements. The evolution of large brains requiring a higher quality, more nutritionally dense diet, an increased body size, and the adaptation of a foraging strategy that necessitated movement over larger ranges, and higher levels of daily energy expenditure. Since the emergence of Homo erectus, our ancestors have been able to colonize every place on the globe. And this colonization of the globe was largely dependent on developing strategies for increasing the energy returns from subsistence activities. We have been quite successful throughout the globe in developing distinct strategies for meeting our nutritional needs. However, when we look at our modern societies, it appears that our nutritional strategies have become a bit too successful. That is, we have become so efficient in obtaining energy with minimal time and effort that we've created ever larger positive energy balances. Here we see some of the evidence for this. Variation in mean body mass indexes among men and women of subsistence level populations, that is, hunter-gatherers, herders, 
and farmers compared to those of the industrialized world. Note for males that the BMIs of the subsistence level groups all cluster in the healthy range between 18 and a half and 25, with the average for each group being significantly less than that of the industrialized nations. The pattern is similar for women. For those of the subsistence populations, mean BMIs cluster between 20 and 23 and are significantly lower than those of the industrialized nations. Of course, in this country, the trends are even more troubling, as evidenced by the dramatic rise in the rate of obesity over the last 50 years. Since the early 1960s, the prevalence of obesity, defined here as BMIs of 30 or greater, has tripled in US men and more than doubled in women. Currently, a third of all Americans are classified as obese. Two of the factors that are most often cited by nutritionists for the dramatic increases in obesity rates are the ever greater avail availability of high calorie, high fat food items and the expansion of portion sizes. Yet, while these changes in consumption patterns are certainly part of the problem, I believe they are not nearly the entire story. In fact, national data show us that there have been only relatively modest increases in daily energy consumption over the last 40 years. Here we see US data on mean daily caloric intake over the last 40 years from the NHANES survey between 1971 and 2006. Over this period, when body weight and obesity rates have increased dramatically, daily energy intake has increased by 170 calories a day in men and about 250 in women. In addition, from these data, it appears that all of the increase took place during the 1980s. That is, between the NHANES 2 and NHANES 3 surveys. This is notable because there was a change in methodology with the NHANES 3. In the first two Haines surveys, dietary data was collected only on weekdays. However, in NHANES 3 and subsequent surveys, data were collected on weekends as well. Consequently, if we look at intakes only for those waves with comparable methodology, that is, 1980s and onward, we find that energy intake has essentially been flat since the mid-1980s, a time period over which obesity has climbed by more than 50%. Thus, contrary to what has been argued in much of the recent nutrition literature, these data suggest that the obesity epidemic cannot be understood solely by looking at intakes. Rather, we must also consider energy expenditure. Unfortunately, we don't have good nationally representative data on activity and energy expenditure in the US. However, recent analyses by Tim Church and his colleagues from the Pennington Institute have used data from US labor statistics to estimate changes in occupational activity and energy expenditure in the US over the last 50 years. Each job activity was assigned a metabolic equivalent, that is, reflecting its physical intensity. And what we see is that with the declines in manufacturing and agricultural jobs and the marked increases in more sedentary service jobs, these authors document a significant decline in average occupational METs and estimate the change in energy expenditure to be about 140 calories a day in men and 125 in women. These findings strongly suggest that shifts in energy expenditure are also important in explaining the obesity epidemic. In addition, we, can also, we also now have a much better understanding of energy expenditure patterns in both urban and traditional societies. When we look at and compare daily energy expenditure levels among men and women of subsistence level populations to those of modern industrialized world, what we see is that average daily energy expenditure in the subsistence populations averages about 3,000 calories a day for the men and 2,300 calories a day for the women, substantially more than we see among the much heavier industrialized populations. So the men in the industrialized world are fully tw 26 pounds heavier and yet have energy expenditures that are about 200 calories less. Similarly, for the women, we find that they are about 18 pounds lighter, and yet, on average, have caloric expenditures that are about 100 calories less. When we express these same data as physical activity levels, that is, looking at the ratio of total energy expenditure to BMR, 
what we find are substantial differences between the two groups. GALs, the overall physical activity level of men in the subsistence population being about 2 compared to 1.7 in the industrialized world and about 1.9 in women of subsistence populations compared to 1.7 in the modern world. In this context, we can then consider what the energetic implications would be of industrialized world adults shifting to an energy budget that would be comparable to that of a subsistence level population. So here we're asking the question of what happens when a man and a woman of the industrialized world match the physical activity level of a subsistence population. This would involve an increase in energy expenditure of about 411 calories a day for the men and 210 calories a day for the women. In this context, we can also ask the additional question of how much additional discretionary activity would had to be, have to be added to our daily lives in order to more closely approximate the physical activity levels of these traditional societies. Here we look at the energetic implications of two different activity regimes. The recent Institute of Medicine's recommendations on activity on an hour of moderate intensity exercise per day, and then also the energetic implications of a full hour of intense aerobic activity per day. What we see is that with the Institute of Medicine's recommendations, this raises the men's caloric expenditure by 190 and the women's by about 150. If we actually look then at adding a full hour of intense exercise, this raises energy expenditure of men by 330 calories and women by fully 260. At this level, note that the women actually exceed energy expenditure levels seen in their subsistence world counterparts. These results suggest that current recommendations on daily physical activity have the potential to bring energy expenditure levels of the industrialized world surprisingly close to those seen among many traditionally living societies. These analyses also underscore what I think is an important feature of physical work among most traditional societies that much daily activity is done at a slow to moderate pace. Consequently, the, the high total levels of energy expenditure and physical activity found in traditional societies generally reflect sustained but modest increases in the metabolic intensity over large portions of the waking day, rather than very high intensity work outputs in short bouts. This observation, I think, has direct implications for our urban society in that it supports a slow but steady approach to promoting healthier lifestyles through greater activity. That is, you don't have to be exercising at near maximal capacity to gain the benefits of greater daily activity. In addressing the growing obesity problem around the world, I think too much attention is often paid to only the food inside of the energy balance equation. In this light, it's encouraging to see the most recent Institute of Medicine's recommendations on dietary guidelines also include recommendations on daily activity. Yet there remains considerable debate about how much physical activity is necessary to promote a healthy lifestyle. As I've suggested here today, I think this is an issue that can and should be addressed from a comparative evolutionary perspective. Looking at the range of energy needs and activity levels in more traditionally living societies in order to give us a better sense of the level of exertion and metabolic demands throughout most of our evolutionary history. To conclude, an evolutionary approach offers to provide important insights into the origin and nature of human chronic disease problems. It provides us with a framework for both evaluating the ways in which our distinctive evolutionary, excuse me, distinctive energy and nutritional demands are at odds with dimensions of the modern world, and for formulating changes that specifically address those imbalances. Like other primates, we're omnivores. Yet our disproportionately large brains necessitate that the quality and density of the and nutritional density of our foods be higher than those of our primate kin. In addition, throughout most of our evolutionary past, the acquisition of our high quality diets required substantial expenditure of energy and movement over large areas. Over time, we've become ever more efficient in extracting energy from our environments, and in this context, the problem of overnutrition currently seen in this country and around the world has extensions with deep evolutionary roots. 
Addressing these problems will thus require attention to both the intake and expenditure sides of the energy balance equation. Thank you very much. Thank you.